open your Bibles with me <clears throat> to John's Gospel, chapter 4. Listen what happened here. So verse 4 of John's Gospel in chapter 4. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Would you give me something to drink? His disciples, by the way, had gone into town to Walmart to get food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and this well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in that person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So he said to her, Go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husbands. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But the Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worship, worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. Now may the Lord just write that word on our hearts. Learning from the master. I... I Love this, and I'm sure you do. This is a, an incredible encounter. You know, right throughout the Scriptures, we find the Lord Jesus, and then, of course, also His disciples, leaving the church precinct, leaving the gathered body and going out among the people. Jesus went out among the people because He loves you. Because you mean everything to him. He went out among the people because he came and gave his life for you. That's why. And this picture that we have here is amazing. And what I'm just going to simply present to us, all of us today, and I know the Lord is going to grip your heart and he's going to inspire you is what can we learn from the master himself? What does Jesus teach us about going among the people? How did he relate? You and I sometimes battle so much basic things. 
you know, many don't even know how to say thank you anymore. Please, thank you, may I. We drop the basic courtesies of life. Sometimes we forfeit our friendliness and our disposition. Jesus, Jesus showed us some incredible things in this encounter with this woman. So I'm just going to extrapolate some things that, that we learn from the Master, and God is going to speak to you. And in the, in the final analysis, I'm inviting you to sit at the feet of Jesus and to give your life to Christ. I'm inviting you to trust this Jesus. Put your faith in Him. Because God loves you so much. What can we learn from the Master? Number one, what did Jesus do? He set out purposefully. You know, verse 4 tells us that Jesus was going to Galilee and that he had to go through Samaria. Jesus set out purposefully. He went strategically. Strategically. Verse 5 and 6 said not only did he have great purpose, but strategically he went to Jacob's will. That's a strategy. Now, why would Jesus have gone to a will? Because that's where water is. People drink water. All people need water. This was a strategy. He knew that people would come to the will. Went purposefully through Samaria, but strategically went to the will. And by the way, when he got to the will, the Bible the Bible says, even though he was worn out and all the rest of him, he still sat down. This is a strategy. He sat down at the well. Now, that's very simple, isn't it? But we know what ended up happening. You don't think Jesus doesn't see you purposefully. He's got a strategy comes and he sits down. He walks by. He visits you. He positions you. This lady didn't get it all, or didn't understand it initially, but God was positioning her. You're not listening to this. You really think you decided to listen this morning? Well, of course we did. Some of us are still asleep because the time changed, but at the very least, some people look like they might be listening. This is, you know, God is just so precious. You know, when you look back at your testimony, you think how strategic God must have known because you just happened to be and you just happened to hear and you just happened to meet. Mm -hmm. He set out purposefully and he went strategically and number three, he connected winsomely. You know, he connected winsomely. You know, I, I, I wish I could have seen this for myself, but I can feel it. Jesus sat down there, and I'm going to get to the awkwardness of this in a minute, because this was awkward, folks. This is, like a, this is like serious awkward. You know, first of all, she was a Samaritan. Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. Second of all, she was she, a woman. This was in Jesus' time. You talk about discrimination. This, this was the day and age in which some of the self-righteous men would stand up and beat their chests and say, thank God I'm not a woman. That sounds horrendous to but that actually happened. And with all the abuse and that goes on even in our world today, can you imagine what happened then? And yet Jesus connected winsomely. He sat down and he said, excuse me, ma'am. Would, would, 
would you give me something to drink? Now connect all the dots. He was at a well. He was sitting down. And a lady came by. And he asked her, would you give me something to drink? He was very winsome about it. He started out at the right place. You need to be just winsome. Talk to people. Jesus just said, Hey, what's up? Could you possibly give me something to drink? It's just so simple. But he entered her heart. He touched her. She, she connected with that. It was a joy. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter who people are out there. People will respond to you when you're winsome. You go out there and act like you're some major dipstick. People are not going to listen to you. <laughs> I didn't call anybody a dipstick. I'm just suggesting. That means you're long, tall, thin, and you're just covered with grease. Or maybe you're short and not so thin and still covered with grease. He just connected winsomely. Number four, he engaged personally. Isn't that, a, isn't that beautiful? You know, from, from verse 9 and following, he just engaged her personally. He didn't throw up his arms. You know, if you, if you analyze the content of this conversation, I mean, she... He spoke to her in a very personable way. He didn't throw bullets at her. He didn't sit there and say, hmm. Well, you know, despite the fact that you're a Samaritan, I'm going to tolerate that for a minute, and you can give me something to drink. There was no haughtiness in what he said. He didn't drive a wedge. He spoke to her personally. This encounter was amazing because this was in Samaria. Don't have time to do a history lesson, but this goes way back to the time of Jacob. Remember, Jacob had 12 sons. One of them was Joseph. You can go back and read the blessing of Joseph and then his sons. And then you can fast forward through all the history of this region and the dividing of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom's headquarters were Samaria, and the southern kingdom, and I'm being simplistic, were, was Jerusalem. So there was this big division between the Samaritans and the Jews, those who worshipped God. God creator, Yahweh, Jehovah, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Samaritans who worship many gods, and not only that, because of their religious disposition and the license they had, they also had permission to marry foreigners. So they all became mixed up. The Jews didn't believe that. So you got all these cross-cultural things. This was horrendous. What? You mean Jesus would sit down <laughs> at a well and ask a Samaritan, oh, a woman? I, I, get, I get it. But in those days, you didn't even talk to a woman. Okay, now let's just go back. To Jesus' time. He set out purposefully and went strategically and he connected winsomely and he engaged her personally. He talked to her as an equal, as a human being. Hello, how are you? One on one. 
one person to the other. Jesus did that with everyone. He had no color in his eyes. He had no gender in his eyes. He had no politics in his framework. He treated all people the same because he loved them. Number five, he captured curiosity. Verse 10, he captured her curiosity. Well, I, I love this. I mean, what a question. She says to him, you know, wait a minute, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, I'm a woman, you want me to give you something to drink? What does Jesus say? He says, if you knew the drink of God, who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, he would have given you life-giving water. That's kind of like a statement, a question. It's a humdinger. It's like dropping a little thundercracker right in front of her. Like, what? You talk about curiosity. What did you say? You mean you can give me something and I'll never die? What does that mean? That's curiosity. Aren't you interested in knowing how it is that you can know that actually when you die, you won't die? Can I just tell you something? Just by the way, I just want you to listen up. Do you know when you give your heart to Jesus, and the moment you take that final breath, you're just picked up by the angels and you're taken into the presence of Jesus. Did, by the way, just get this. I've got to, I've got to tell you this because I don't want you to miss this. Did you know this? That there is not one person who has ever died that's dead. Did you know that? It's like, what are you doing? What? <laughs> he captured her curiosity. Number six, he listened attentively. She, she came back then in verse 11, and she wanted to get through all of this. Jesus didn't interrupt her. By the way, some of us interrupt too much. All look at me for a minute. Just stop talking so much. And all of you are looking at me saying, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You don't have to nod like that. I'm, I get it. My big challenge is just <laughs> is to, you know, let somebody else actually have something to say. I mean, he listened attentively. Didn't just bulldoze her. Number seven, he answered pointedly. When she talked, she said then verse 13, boom, he answered pointedly. Went straight to the point. He said, yep. He said, I give you water to drink, you'll never thirst again. You'll have eternal life. That's pointed. Do you know sometimes when we talk to people about Jesus, we beat around the bush so much we forget what bush we're beating around. I'm all for having a cup of tea with someone to lead them to Jesus. But I think sometimes you've just drunk enough tea. Don't overspend making friends for Christ. Get on and lead people to Christ. I think that's what Jesus is saying here. But in the right way, he answered pointedly. Then he loved unconditionally. I love point number eight. He loved unconditionally. Because he just, he said, go and get your husband. Of course, this is Jesus. She said, I don't know. Jesus looked at her and he said, you're right. Jesus knew exactly. Do you know how many people, folks, listen, listen to this. Do you know what we tend to do? We tend to wipe people out of God's book because of sin or because of the condition of their life or because of the jail sentence or because of what they've gone through. We make that decision. Jesus doesn't. That's why we're the church where everyone can invite anyone. Anyone is welcome at First Baptist Church. Anyone. Well, can, can these, yes, 
because Jesus said yes. So if you look at it and try and boil it down, there's somebody out there who said, well, I don't know about that, you know. We just decided, I mean, wait a minute, you know, divorce is just the worst thing. Well, this lady had had five husbands. And by the way, the one she was, she wasn't even living right when she spoke. She was living in sin. Because living together without marriage is not an option according to Scripture. That's not an option that you have. Not according to the Bible. Doesn't matter what society says or what the world says. That is sin in the eyes of God. Period. That's what God says. But Jesus here was speaking, and, and he loved her unconditionally. And then finally, but not conclusively, he pointed to himself unapologetically. I love that last verse. Jesus declared, I'm, I'm the one. Me. You know. He just, he just pointed to himself unconditionally. Here's, here's what I'd like to recommend that we take away with ourselves. I I'm going to suggest to you and to me that we ask God, you ask God to give you four things, to do four things for you, all right? Number one, ask God to give you a wide view, a wide view. Ask God to let you see Samaria and Judea the uttermost parts of the earth. Ask God to let you see the other neighborhood, the other people, the other person. Ask God to give you a wide view. Number two, ask God to give you an inclusive embrace. Inclusive embrace. Ask God to help you love all people with no strings attached. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Watch me. That's jolly hard to do. Can I tell you why? Because some people are jolly hard to love, right? <laughs> you think everybody's just a cuddle bunny? Mm-mm. I can see some of you doing that to your husband right now. I mean, there's some, there are some tough customers out there, man. You, run, you and I run into them all the time. You ever met someone who just, it's like all the time they've got to chew a brick. <laughs> Always. I mean, it's just like, come on, man. Stop it. Have you ever met someone that always complain? Always win. Always got it. Always got it. Who, excuse me, who said everybody is easy to love? That's not the point. Ask God to give you an inclusive embrace. Say, Lord Jesus, help me to love all people the same. And you know what? He'll do it. He'll do it. See people the way Jesus saw them. Number one, ask, for a, you know, ask God to give you a wide view. Ask God to give you an inclusive embrace. Ask God to give you an engaging attitude. <laughs> An engaging attitude. Ask God to do it. He'll do it. I'm telling you. Ask God, just say, Lord Jesus, please help me just to be engaging, winsome. And, and the Lord will do that. We've all got our personality dispositions, all of us. We've all got our ways and ups and downs and rounds and, you know, We've all got our ways of doing things. Ask God to give you an engaging attitude. One more. Here's one more. Ask God to give you a straight message. When you witness, when you go out and you share your faith, ask God to give you a straight message, to keep you on target. Jesus. We would love to invite you to join the journey. It starts with literally getting your ticket. Your ticket is saying yes to Jesus Christ, to Savior and Lord. It's something you can do right where you are. I'd love to lead you as you just pray in your heart, talking to God. God, I realize my sin has 
has separated me from you. I've messed up. We've all messed up. But Jesus, today I realize how much you love me, so I turn my back on my past life. I ask you to control my life. You, I want to make the boss of my life, not me. So Jesus, change me. I believe you're the Son of God, and I accept you today as Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, we've got some wonderful resources Dr. Don wants you to have that will help you move forward in this great life that we call the Christian life. Give us a call. Let's spend some time talking together and showing you how this is not only your fire insurance, not only the, the protection from, from hell and the joy of heaven, but a way to live wonderfully right here and now. Let's connect. I cannot begin to describe to you how incredible, what a privilege and an honor to sit at the feet of Dr. Billy Graham as his friend and pastor for so many years, right there at his home every Saturday. I've put that down in Saturdays with Billy. My thoughts, this relationship, never violating any confidences, just sharing the life of this extraordinary man that God touched and used across the world to reach so many people for Christ, friends of presidents and prime ministers. You don't want to miss this opportunity. It is filled with personal anecdotes, but above all, the blessings that flow from the heart of God's servant, Dr. Billy Graham. Hello, my friends. Thank you for watching the Encouraging Word on YouTube. If you were blessed by this message, would you like it, comment, and perhaps would you subscribe and get connected with us? In fact, if you want to discover more about the Encouraging Word, visit our website at tewonline.org. God bless you today.